It's time for your weekly fix of wrestling nostalgia. When we look at wrestling's past eras, from the Attitude Era, to the Reality Era. I'd like to think that maybe this company will be better after Vince McMahon's dead, but the fact is, it's it's going to get taken over by his idiotic daughter and his doofus son-in-law and the rest of his stupid family. To today. Here on the WWE Podcast. Welcome to the WWE Podcast. Today's Monday, July 8th, 2019, and I'm excited about today because it's one of my favorite memories as a wrestling fan, and that is Kane versus The Undertaker, WrestleMania 14, their very first encounter, so... A lot of thoughts on that, and uh, it's time to get nostalgic, so I will do that in just a moment, but I just want to let you guys know, I know that normally my shows are done on Sunday uh, with the holiday weekend, and I was traveling, um, just a lot of different things going on. I wasn't able to do Sunday, but I just moved it to Monday, so that's what I'm doing today, and you have me now the next three days straight, so Tuesday, tomorrow will be the Raw Review, Wednesday, SmackDown, and then Thursday, I will be back with my co-host for the week in uh, Anthony DeMarco. So a full week of wrestling ahead of you to get you ready for Extreme Rules uh, six days away. And so that should be a very a very interesting show on a lot of levels of where and how much influence Paul Heyman and Eric Bischoff sh- you know, kind of show their, um, their, their fingerprints on the show. Maybe they don't. Maybe it's more reserved. Maybe it's more of the same. We will have to, to take a wait-and-see approach, and we'll be reviewing and previewing the pay-per-view as we come closer to it and giving predictions, as always. Uh, on the Thursday show with my co-host, we'll be running down the entire card for Extreme Rules. So uh, it's going to be a fun week of wrestling midsummer. It is, boy, it's hot. I, mean, I don't know why you guys are living, but it is, it's toasty up here. In upstate New York, very toasty, um, but I'm not complaining because before you know it, the leaves will be turning in a month and a half, two months, and we're going the other way. So, um, all right. Now, as I get into this, I want you guys to take yourself in the Wayback Machine and take yourself back to when Kane first debuted, and and we all remember, and I did an entire show on the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view. Well, it was actually called Bad Blood in October of 1997. Kane debuted, ripped the door off of the cell, and it, it, it genuinely scared me. I mean, I remember I was, I think I was 12 years old, right? And Kane ripped the door off, ends up tombstoning The Undertaker, allows Shawn Michaels to crawl out of a pool of his own blood to cover The Undertaker for the three count. And for weeks and weeks and weeks, Undertaker would not fight back against his brother. It was one of the best storylines ever written in WWE. And the reason for that, it, it just made you feel emotional. You know, a lot of us have brothers and, and or sisters. We can relate to <clears throat> not wanting to retaliate against a sibling that does... May not may not be physical harm, but it could be a verbal altercation. You're just trying to keep the peace. And Undertaker took the high road in this program as the face and tried to not fight back against Kane. And Undertaker would continually get beat down by Undertaker would get continually beat down by Kane. And there was a moment on Raw where Undertaker instead of just covering up and letting Kane go to town on him, there was a moment I remember very vividly <clears throat> where he finally just, he stopped Kane after he was about, he, you know, Kane was about to punch him again and Undertaker blocked it. And then the crowd went crazy thinking, oh, Undertaker's finally going to fight back. And then what happened was he just continued to get beat down by Kane, but it just told the story so well. After um, the Royal Rumble that year, so October he debuted, Royal Rumble is when uh, Undertaker was put in a casket 
and then set on fire by Cain after Cain allegedly had just said, okay, you know, I'm going to form an alliance with you. They extended hands. And I remember J.R. saying, oh, what a moment. And so there was a faux alliance there. And then Kane turns his back on Undertaker again at Royal Rumble and ends up uh, getting put in the casket and then set on fire. And we don't see Undertaker for weeks and weeks and weeks leading up to WrestleMania 14. And when Undertaker finally returned to face the Undertaker and, and tell – when Undertaker finally returned to face Kane and tell Kane, hey, I'm done with this. I'm going to whoop your ass. That was a hell of a return. So instead of me just telling you about it, why don't you guys just listen to a little bit of it? I'd like you to get immersed in the actual audio. Take yourself back. And if you haven't seen this program, again, anytime I do Wrestling Nostalgia, it's for your benefit to listen to it because it will make you a fan all over again. So here's a little bit of audio from when Undertaker returned after getting the casket set on fire from a double cross again from Kane. And Undertaker had had enough. So take a listen. destroy that that does not wish to perish. And you, Paul, the audacity to come out here week after week in his face. and claim responsibility for my disappearance. The fact of the matter is, on those times... While I return to the world of darkness, it's of my own accord. It's a time for spiritual healing. It's a time for the truth. And I know the truth. And this trip, what I was doing was soothing the souls of my parents. Because I had to explain to them why I would have to do the one thing I promise never to do. So in that moment, uh, you guys are a little bit long, I know, but worth hearing every word because it told such an amazing story. Paul Bearer, who is one of my favorite managers of all time, I, I know that he's in the Hall of Fame, but I really believe is one of the most underrated, uh, just amazingly talented mouthpieces for Kane and for Undertaker, although Kane, Undertaker didn't really need a mouthpiece. He was a great addition to the character, and there were times where Paul Bear would flip back and forth, but 
This is the first time that he had turned against The Undertaker and sided with Kane. And for week after week after week, Paul Bearer was coming out there and saying, you know, that he's responsible for uh, The Undertaker's disappearance. Undertaker's gone. Um, Basically, they've killed him. Uh, Again, remember, this is the Attitude Era, so there's really no limits. Uh, But... It was just week after week, you were tired of hearing Paul Bearer. You were tired of seeing Kane come out and basically gloat about the fact that he destroyed his brother. Um, And then we all knew Undertaker was coming back. It was just a matter of when. And this happened on March 2nd, 2000, or excuse me, March 2nd, 1998 is when uh, this particular Raw had uh, had aired and then WrestleMania was just, I believe, um, what, three weeks later after that? And so they timed it perfectly to reach the peak of this rivalry at WrestleMania. An amazing story. There was a, there's a family tie there. Believable backstory. Uh, believable characters. Undertaker standing there walking through the fire that Kane put up on the stage. Uh, just so much sim- symbolism, I guess, is the right word, and so much emotion in that storyline, and it-, it was just awesome to see. And then, um, so that's the build to the match, and then we get to the actual match, which took place on March twenty ninth, nineteen ninety eight, in Boston, and that was before. Remember, this is before WWE went stadium happy with their WrestleManias which I believe happened starting at WrestleMania 21, 22, something like that, I think, somewhere around there. And if you also recall, on a side note, this is also the WrestleMania where Stone Cold Steve Austin won his first WWF championship against Shawn Michaels. Uh, So maybe I'll review that sometime too, but also extremely significant, probably the biggest note of the show. However, this story building into this match is one of the most, one of the best built stories for some of the reasons I just gave you. Brother versus brother. The backstory of uh, Kane blaming The Undertaker for his parents' death. Uh, Paul Heyman, or excuse me, Paul Bearer, who ended up flipping from The Undertaker for the very first time to Kane. And so the build, the anticipation, was damn near perfect. Now, was this a five star classic? No, I don't think it was. I don't think it was. Certainly by not not by today's standards of 720 splashes and who can uh, do the most flips in the air and all that kind of stuff, which is really cool to see. But when you tell a hell of a backstory and the creative is right, the match itself almost doesn't matter as much if it ends up not being the classic that it could have been. And this is a perfect example. These two are both huge men. Both of them in their prime. So this was a very slow and methodical at times match. But it was meant to be that way. For the pacing to allow the audience to absorb what was going on. And take in the moves. Instead of just what's next, what's next. Show me the coolest move. Show me the next cool move. What's the next cool move. What's the next cool move. It's okay. This makes sense. They start out punching each other, kicking each other. It gradually builds to power move versus power move, and then you get to the finish, right? That's the typical pacing of a match. But they did it in a way that was... It gave you time to understand what was going on and feel what the wrestlers were feeling at the time. And with the commentary from Jim Ross, that never hurts. Jim Ross can make you... You know, as the old saying goes, and one of his sayings, actually, I'm stealing, it would bring a tear to a glass eye sometimes. Sometimes he can make you feel, and uh, Jim Ross just knows how to make and sell almost anything. So having him on commentary certainly, certainly helped. And, uh, I mean, Jerry the King Lawler, too. I mean, I'm not going to discredit him. Um, But Jim Ross is really the one uh, steering the ship here. And so let me give you guys a little bit of audio from the finish of the match, and then I'll fill in the holes. I'm not going to let you guys sit for a 15-minute audio clip, but I want to give you the finish of the match and then fill in the blanks of, uh, of what you didn't hear. Look at the 
must be enough. My God, what will it take if it's not? Yes, the Undertaker has won this match. So Undertaker comes out victorious. I don't think any surprise there. I mean, if you have watched anything in the Attitude Era, that's not a surprise. I don't think I'm spoiling anything. Uh, what, 21 years later? But that match, when you look at how it was laid out, was so well laid out because Undertaker, or excuse me, Kane, was a complete monster. The best part of his career was the beginning of his career. And having him... Having Kane be built as this complete crazy monster that is, you know, he just takes finishers and kicks out. He takes chair shots and they don't affect him. Um, he has beaten, what, eight man on, it was like a, I don't know, he's done some crazy handicap matches and Kane has squashed them all. Uh, I remember him involved with the headbangers, um, just, just so many different men that were demolished by Kane when he first debuted. Um, and so having Undertaker be able to take down Kane was huge to reestablish that Undertaker is still the big dog in the yard. Again, that phrase meant a lot, something much different in 1998 than it does in 2019. But Kane kicked out of not one, but two tombstones, and it took three to put him down. And even then, he almost kicked out. Um, that's a big deal because... Back in the 90s, kicking out of finishers was not very common, particularly the tombstone that was a case-closed money finish that just you knew when Undertaker hit it, it was game over. It was a very protected finish. And so having Kane kick out of not one but two of them, even though Kane lost the match, Really gave a great rub to Kane and didn't damage him at all. I don't believe he almost kicked out of three. So, I mean, when you look at it, Kane, I mean, on the third one, it was one, two, and the referee counted three, but Kane got his shoulder up at three and, you know, three and a quarter. So, it, it was just so well laid out. And the kickouts of the tombstones were not even like real true kickouts, it was almost like a body twitch. I mean, go watch, you'll, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. And Undertaker accidentally, it looked like, dropped him on his head for the first tombstone. It looked, uh, yikes. Um, <laughs> I mean, yikes. But it was a just such a good match. Um, and clearly the, the, uh, the fans were waiting for Stone Cold Steve Austin. I mean, he was the up-and-coming biggest star and still is the biggest star ever in professional wrestling history. I don't care what brand, year, or era you're looking at or company, Stone Cold Steve Austin was the biggest ever in terms of draw, in terms of money, um, in terms of uh, T-shirts sold, in terms of pay-per-view buys, in terms of house attendance, pay-per-view attendance, paper. I mean, like, you name it. He burned the hottest. He managed to burn the longest, but he burned the hottest. And so the crowd that night was looking for Stone Cold, who was the main event. And uh, it was just, it was very uncommon to see finishers being kicked out which is why it was so awesome i mean when you look at it stone cold won the wwf championship with one stone cold stunner on Shawn michaels think about that think about that i mean in in the main event of wrestlemania stone cold won with a single stunner so it's just times have changed and i would love for wwe to kind of go backwards in terms of the f what finishers should be. And they're exactly what they sound like they should be. The finish of a match. Today, you, you, don't only, you don't only have wrestlers kicking out of multiple finishers on probably house shows as well, but TV, uh, pay-per-views for sure. It's just, it's very uncommon to see one finishing maneuver end a match and it what it does is it doesn't it does a disservice to the maneuver itself it adds predictability rather than unpredictability uh and it waters down the word finisher and furthermore 
You have guys who are using finishers that are now just using it as common maneuvers. Meaning, what I like, think about this the DDT used to be a finishing maneuver. It's now just a common move that no one ever, ever gets pinned with, other than John Moxley, who uses dirty deeds, and Andrade, who has the hammerlock DDT. You have guys using DDTs left and right, even Randy Orton, who has made it just a signature move that has never, ever won a match with, uses the DDT. Jake the Snake Roberts used the DDT as a finish. And it's rightfully should be a finish. Think about what you're doing. You're driving a man's skull straight into the mat, spiking his skull into the mat that is made of a very thin layer of foam and mostly plywood. Think about that. Just just think about it. <laughs> so I see why it should have been a finish, but it's just been defined down to a common maneuver. Furthermore, the super kick, probably the most violated finishing maneuver by Shawn Michaels who made it the most famous is now being used by one out of every uh, one out of every two wrestlers in a match this, I mean the Usos are probably a exhibit A Dolph Ziggler although he does occasionally get a pin off of it is also a huge violator of it so, uh, Seth Rollins Finn Balor, I mean, the list goes on. Everyone uses the super kick, and it very rarely ever ends a match. And that's a damn shame, because it's not as if they are even presenting it in a way that's different from Sweet Chin Music, other than stomping in the corner, tuning up the band. The maneuver, the physics of it are the exact same as Shawn Michaels. So... And that, rightfully, too, should be a finish. You are hitting a knockout shot. Underneath the chin is a known place on the human body that can cause unconsciousness if hit in the right location. Under the chin. So when you have multiple stars using it, and it's just used as a just kind of a transition move, or, oh, what a kick, I mean, but you know it's never going to end the match... Even though some of them are planted very nicely, they're very well done, you look at it and go, oh, that's that's he's knocked out, he's done. And it's just transition into, okay, I'm going to beat up on you, but, oh, I hit my kick, now I'm going to beat up on you. I mean, that's what it feels like now. And I would like for people to, people, stars, wrestlers, to go back to using moves that make sense as finishing maneuvers and leave known finishers in the past as finishers and not as common maneuvers. So it's it, super kick is probably again, the most violated, even the choke slam now is being used by Baron Corbin. And has he ever gotten a, a uh, pin off of it? Nope. Nope. I, I mean, so I, I guess my point is if finishers are finishers, let them be exactly that. Let them be finishing maneuvers. I don't want to see a, a finishing maneuver done to a star and go, yeah, that's okay. Well, that, he hit the finish, but he's going to kick out. Like, I don't want to feel like that. I don't want to feel like the finish. I mean, why don't they just call it the semi finish? Because that's ultimately what it is. Or the maybe finishing maneuver. It's not a finish if you, if a, you have stars kicking out left and right. I understand signature moves are different. Like Shawn Michaels' elbow off the top, very rarely, if maybe ever, ended up winning a match. Uh, but the Sweet Chin Music did. And today, it's just, it doesn't create any drama for me when I see somebody kick out of a finish. And that's a shame because that is such a, it's such a, huge way, major way to be able to get people's reactions and, and get people going, oh my god, I can't believe he kicked out. And I don't feel that way. And I want to. <laughs> I want to feel that way. And I, I just don't. Um, but I'm, I'm sure that's not going to go away. Um, I, you know, if it were a perfect world, I would only have guys kick out of finishing maneuvers 
at major pay-per-views. And it wouldn't be, you know, six or seven. I mean, look at how many times. And it, by all means, it was an amazing match. But John Cena's AA on AJ Styles. How many times at SummerSlam, I believe it was two, three years ago when they had, I mean, it was it was an, just a great match with those two. Amazing. I hope they have a program again. And I think there's a possibility considering that AJ just turned heel now. But think about how many times people kicked out of the AA. It, it almost became a running joke. John Cena had a better chance at this at that point. It really, really, even now, of you know hitting a clothesline and getting a pin versus hitting his AA, formerly the FU. Than getting, I mean, just but the, but my point with the AJ Styles match was that how many finishing maneuvers did John Cena hit before AJ Styles eventually won? I mean, AJ kicked out of an AA off the second rope, which admittedly actually made me go, Oh my God. <laughs> I, you know, anytime John Cena has hit a finishing maneuver, fit his AA off the second rope, it usually puts the guy down. Um, I know I'm going back to SummerSlam now, but I, I just in general would like to see the business move towards a more realistic type of physic, physical, um, just reactions from stars and believability in terms of, okay, Hey, I mean, even if you look at the basics, why are closed fists legal? Nobody ever uses open fists anymore, and neither does the referee enforce it. You don't see referees going around saying, hey, open your fist. No, no closed fists. No closed fists. It doesn't happen. Everybody's got a closed fist. And if that were true, don't you think there'd be a lot more blood, bruising, and broken bones? I mean, that's just a basic, but everyone does it. Everyone has a closed fist. Um, And I understand that this is professional wrestling, but I don't want to be reminded on a minute-by-minute basis of what I'm seeing is nonsensical and is clearly not real. Just take a step back from the finishers and let them be finishers. And it'll be... You can re-educate the audience. It's not too late it's never too late to go back on that because you could just have, okay, guys, listen, in, in a staff meeting, production meeting, from here on out, I don't know, for however many months may, or weeks even, I, I don't know, I don't know how you, however you wanted to do it in, in the time frame you wanted to do it, you could say nobody kicks out of a finish or escapes a um, submission maneuver. You could do that. You could do that and re-educate the audience. I would do it for a long period of time so that fans get – acclimated to oh wow okay finishers are putting people down and they're putting them down quickly and decisively and nobody's kicking out great now when it happens guess what you think guess what the fans do go oh my god but it's going to take time it's going to take repetition and it's going to take stars and and creative to commit to that that, hey, okay, we're not doing that. We're not going to rely on kickouts of finishers as drama every single time. So just a, a little bit of a, a mini side note on that. Uh, but overall, guys, I know I'm trying to focus back to Undertaker and Kane. And they went on to have many more matches. I was even there at the WrestleMania 20 in Madison Square Garden when Undertaker returned as the dead man after being the American badass for years and years. And he returned to face Kane and people were going crazy because he finally grew his hair back out and um, they were clamoring for the dead man. I was too. And it ended up being Undertaker victorious once again. And that was fine with me. I, you know, I didn't think it was as special as their first one, but Paul Bearer was there, which made it really cool. Uh, and, Just anytime these two are in the ring together, there's a chemistry there. Um, I mean, even as the Brothers of Destruction, after they, you know, they had their alliance and um, they were just dominant as the Brothers Brothers of Destruction. They were even perfect opponents for the two-man power trip when Stone Cold turned heel and aligned himself with Triple H. Kane and The Undertaker were there to foil the plans of those two. two evil SOBs. Uh, And so they were successful together. They were successful apart. Um, When they did the tribute to Paul Bearer 
that was pretty emotional uh, when I believe it was in 2013 when Paul Bearer passed away and Kane was, uh, uh, I don't know, he was in a match and Undertaker came out and helped him to his feet and then they stood on the top of the stage and were uh, just put their hands up in the air as kind of an old tribute to Paul Bearer and the career that he had. And um, th- there's just so much. I mean, I-, I probably could do an entire show just on Paul Bearer, who was such a brilliant, brilliant uh, promo guy. Um, he was easily dislikable and was a perfect fit in addition to Undertaker and Kane and their whole storyline. And uh, so I was a big, big fan of Paul Bear. But again, um, th- this was this was about the match at WrestleMania 14. And what did you guys think? I mean, I'm giving you guys my opinion, but were you around during that time? Do you remember the WrestleMania 14 match with Kane and Undertaker for the very first time? Uh, let me know your thoughts at the WWE podcast on Twitter. And also on WWEpodcast.com, which just so you guys know, you can put comments in the uh, every post that I put up. And uh, so check that out. You're more than welcome to do that. I, of course, moderate the comments because anybody could put anything up. So um, but by all means, like I, I'm encouraging discussion on the comments board of every post that I put up. So feel free to comment as you will. Um, all right. So uh as we move on the line, down the line here, I have a couple of news items and I want to discuss. And that is Randy Orton, who has been off TV since um, June, early June. Uh, he's been out due to a neck injury and he's out just basically mending that injury. Um, so I'm assuming that it's probably not anything too serious, but anything to anytime you're dealing with the neck, it's serious by default. But I expect Randy Orton back probably in the um, very near future. Again, I, I picked him as the Aleister Black opponent at the Extreme Rules pay-per-view, which is when we will find out. There are rumors and there's news links all over of who Aleister Black's opponent could be. I really don't want to click on it because I don't. I want to be surprised. You know, it's easy to click on a spoiler. I don't want to do that. Um, but my thoughts are that it's Randy Orton who is coming to pick a fight with Aleister Black, who I believe is being cast as a heel, as he should be. So uh, that is one of the news items coming out this week. And uh, Raw is actually going to be going on the air in just a few minutes as I record this. So um, hopefully you guys are are watching the show and uh, you, know, you are maybe keeping me in the background. Uh, another item that was coming through the line tonight is Rey Mysterio is appearing on Monday night. The WWE is advertising Rey Mysterio as a return. And what does he do? You know, what do you do with Samoa Joe, who is in a program with Kofi Kingston, but Rey Mysterio is returning and inexplicably gave away his United States championship, just handed it to Samoa Joe? Because I'm, I mean... I just, I honestly don't even know how to explain that. Were you directed by management? I, I could see a heel manager or a heel general manager forcing the babyface to give the championship to the heel, thereby the heel never earning anything, making you dislike them even more. But it looked like it was presented as Rey Mysterio just on a whim or on of his own accord giving Samoa Joe that United States championship. Just what what? I after Samoa Joe has berated and gone after his family and his and his kid, I mean I what I don't know. I, I'm just before I get myself in a tizzy and go on a rant, I'm just gonna stop there. But Rey Mysterio is coming back. He is advertised to return. I don't know who he will be returning against. Again, you'd think Samoa Joe, but with Samoa Joe in a major program, I don't think that's going to be the case. So it's always good to see Mysterio back in the ring. It looks like, again, he hasn't lost a step since he came back, which is absolutely mind-blowing. So credit to him. Uh, another item that they're advertising for Monday Night Raw is that Shane McMahon and Drew McIntyre will be in action against Roman Reigns and a partner of Shane's choosing. So... You can imagine who that partner is probably going to be. Could it be 
Elias. I mean, it's probably somebody that Roman doesn't get along with very well. I'm going to guess that it's not Seth Rollins, right? So that is something that is uh, is on the table for Monday Night Raw and will likely either close the show or will be in a semi-main event spot on Monday Night Raw uh, as we build the heat for Roman against Drew and Shane McMahon against The Undertaker. I know that they're in a tag team, but that seems to be the pairing off uh, of the of the individuals. So does Undertaker make an unannounced, unadvertised appearance? Maybe. I like that. I like when they do that. I don't always need an advertised, uh, a full advertisement and rundown of who's going to be on the show. I like to be surprised. So do we get the gong? I'm thinking Shane, is, since Shane is choosing Roman's opponent, it's not going to fare well for Roman. And Roman could get beat up again, maybe in a very precarious position, which will allow the gong to go off. Maybe Undertaker doesn't actually appear, but the gong goes off. More mind games. Maybe he you know, has lightning strike the posts of the ring. I don't know. Maybe some hocus pocus happens. But I think Undertaker's appearance could be very well warranted here, given that the match is this Sunday. Uh, I, I would expect Undertaker would be there in some form or fashion to build this match. Uh, and and uh, that'll be cool. It's always good to see Undertaker, regardless of how what your opinion of him may be. And I, be, you know, I think the majority of the opinion out there is, Undertaker, please retire. Uh, you, you know, um, and I'm, you know, I'm on that boat. I, I want to I see him go out on his own terms, not just kind of hang on for the sake of hanging on to get to that round 30 number of hanging in WWE. Uh, but I believe he will get to the 30 number. But I am taking The Undertaker's presences and appearances at a premium, and I'm enjoying them, even though I know that he's not the man that he was. I've accepted that. But I am also appreciative of him being able to be there and WWE bringing him on screen as part of a storyline. And uh, I'm just taking in and soaking in the moments that Undertaker's there because it's not going to be lasting much longer. Uh, so that is... That's my thought on The Undertaker and the pile-on that people seem to be doing of just how terrible he is nowadays. We need to appreciate the legend that is The Undertaker in whatever form that he's in right now because these are very fleeting days. These are fleeting days of The Undertaker being in a wrestling ring. Um, Additionally, on Monday Night Raw, we get to look forward to the awkwardness of Becky and Seth. Now, I'm sure that some of you may disagree with me. That's fine. I think these two need to get the hell away from each other on camera. I alluded this to this with my co-host last week, and we said in tandem that these two need to get the hell away from each other ASAP. After this tag team match for winner take all is gone, and, and Seth and Becky retain their respective championships, It is time for them to pretend that they do not exist on WWE television because it just it not only is it awkward and it's destroying Becky's character with all of her trying to be cute and weird whims and and just stuff that I don't I don't know if they know if they should bring it on camera or if creative is coming up for cute things for them to say or do or just show their humility and humanity and humanize them as they're just like every other couple. Aren't they just so cute together? Look how cool they are. And they just get each other. It's, it's very uh, overdone. And I think that it's just time. Hopefully pray, cross your fingers that after this Sunday, we never have to see these two interact in any kind of awkward position again. Now, am I saying that they'll they will do this? No, they'll probably continue to off and on bring these two together to again. Oh, they're so relatable, aren't they? So cute. Oh, that's such a cute couple. Oh, th- that's not what I'm thinking. And furthermore, I don't want to think that for these two. I don't want to think, oh, what a cute couple. They're so cute together. They're you know they have such great chemistry, aren't they? Just great together. N- nope, no, no. I'm not watching the Young and the Restless. I'm watching Monday Night Raw and Tuesday Night Smackdown Live. That's the shows that I'm watching. And when I watch wrestling, I want to see wrestling. And when I get this other sideshow stuff, even if that's the goal and they accomplish the goal, if they had great on-screen chemistry, 
that still detracts from what they have accomplished and what they are. I really believe that. It's very difficult to separate the relationship and the professional. I understand that. But right now, these two are on separate journeys, and we need to keep it that way. So, again, this is, uh, this is wrestling. I don't need the sideshow stuff. Uh, so, uh, also, it's going to be interesting to see how they follow up with AJ Styles' freshly turned heel with the club and how that manifests itself into ex- AJ's explanation, how he treats the audience is going to be fun to hear again, all of that. Um, and who is going to oppose them, right? What team of baby faces is going to stand up to these three? That is the question. So it's going to be an interesting week of Raw, interesting week of SmackDown, and should be an excellent Extreme Rules. I'm going to say... I'm very optimistic about it because there's new executive directors underneath the creative helms for both shows. Not that everything's going to change overnight, but we'll see gradual steps, and that's what I'm looking for. And also, the seeds for SummerSlam are now being planted. So that we need to look for that. I mean, they were probably planted weeks ago, months ago, but we will see the SummerSlam card come into full focus after the uh, pay-per-view Monday Night Raw next week. So a week from now, we should see the full SummerSlam card, at least in a major uh, uh, major match way. The big matches, who that's going to be, come into play. Uh, because clearly Baron Corbin and Lacey Evans are moving on, as they should, to different avenues and, and different opponents, and so should Seth and Becky. And so whoever they get involved with on Monday night is going to be a big telltale sign as to who they will be facing at SummerSlam. And really, that goes for the rest of the roster. That really does. So uh, I'm going to be interested to see it. Does R-Truth get his championship back? Maybe. Um, So that's also true. Uh, What about Braun Strowman? What's next for him? Who knows? Is Braun Strowman going to be... Speaking about what happened last week, the follow-up to that has got me very interested. I know I saw Bobby Lashley's take, but I'm looking for what Braun Strowman has to say and how they're going to follow that up um, in, in what they they say. I'm, I'm assuming that it's going to lead to a match at Extreme Rules, even though that they said that Braun Strowman has multiple fractures or a, a spleen that's... Uh, I I don't know, ruptured spleen, whatever they said, I still believe that Braun Strowman will make it to Extreme Rules to follow up on this match with Bobby Lashley. So it's an interesting week, and WWE has me interested. As I said, last Monday Night Raw was the best Raw I've seen in probably over a year. So let's see if they can continue that. But all right, well, guys, that's all I have for today. I hope you enjoy the wrestling nostalgia and a little bit of a preview for Raw. Even though by the time you listen to this, Raw is probably over. That's cool, but uh, I just want to give my thoughts in real time. So... Thank you so much for joining me again tomorrow. I'll be back with the Monday Night Raw review. Tuesday night will be that. Wednesday night will be SmackDown Live review. And then Thursday is a co-host with uh, Anthony DeMarco. And we'll be covering everything in WWE this week, including the full preview and prediction show for Extreme Rules this Sunday, uh, July 14th. So big packed week of wrestling audio for you. And I hope you enjoy it. Until then, I'll talk to you next time.